30 years on Thursday since Pat Wall, who was a founding figure of the militant, a long-time president of Bradford Trades Council and a militant supporting Labour MP for Bradford North, passed away. Today, it's actually 30 years exactly since the, his funeral, which was attended by over 700 uh, uh, people. We hope to commemorate this anniversary with more than, than just this event. Uh, Tiki's mentioned the book that I'm working on collecting some of the speeches and articles by Pat that will illustrate the depth of his contribution to the movement. And I'm very grateful to all the comrades that have helped uh, regarding that so far, particularly Pat's family, Pauline, his widow, Charlotte, his granddaughter. But as Tiki said, unfortunately, finishing that's been delayed by COVID, as has uh, having a rally uh, you know, in person in Bradford over the summer like we'd wanted to do. But, you know, to speak, start speaking about Pat then, from all accounts, he was a very modest, humble man, full of kindness to those around him. Uh, um, Keith Dickinson, when I spoke to him about Pat, said he remembered uh, Pat coming to see him off at the train station when he moved down to London from, uh, uh, from Liverpool. Pat was very much a fan of Everton Football Club and uh, of jazz music, particularly that of Charlie Parker. But his involvement in the workers' movement, which I think is what uh, uh, we, we want to really discuss today, began in 1950. Uh, Bill Thompson, the person who recruited Pat into the Labour Party, uh, uh, related uh, this in a letter. He said that he was canvassing for the Labour Party in Garston. He knocked on a door. It was opened by Paddy. When I finished talking, to my surprise, he asked could he help with the campaign and he became a most enthusiastic worker and joined the youth section of the party. And this youth section of the, the Labour Party was called the Labour League of Youth. And our work in this body and its successors was crucial, particularly the Labour Party Young Socialists, which we won a majority on its national committee in 1970. Uh, we used that to produce a, a, a Young Workers Charter, much like we've done in the COVID crisis. And we weren't dislodged from the leading uh, uh, position in that uh, uh, youth organisation until the Labour Party right wing cut the age limit, stopped its conferences and ultimately closed it down as part of the witch hunt of the left and the shift to the right uh, in the party. And we've always referred to our work among young people as one of the twin pillars of our organisation, as being a key to rebuilding our political uh, uh, tendency. Because at that, that time period when Pat got active in the movement was a difficult one for Marxists. I don't have the time to go into all the details, but to carry on from the discussion we had earlier on, on Trotsky, then the leadership of the Fourth International after Trotsky's uh, murder failed to apply his method to the new developments in the post-war period. Those who carried the torch of genuine Trotskyism around people like Ted Grant and Jimmy Dean were re reduced to a handful. But one of the places they had a certain base of support was in Liverpool, where Jimmy was based, with two of his brothers and other members of fam family, including his mother, uh, being uh, uh, members of our uh, tendency as well. And it was through this branch around the Dean family that Pat joined our tendency, which in the Labour League of Youth produced a, a journal to reach out to others called Rally, based on the uh, initials of read about the Labour League of Youth. Uh, Pat became a member of the National Committee of the League of Youth in 1953, shortly before Labour's right wing uh, uh, shut, it, shut it down. We actually produced a variety of different short-lived publications around this time, including a second journal uh, called Rally, this time based in the Walton constituency in Liverpool, which Pat was on the editorial board of uh, 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 as well. And this new rally was produced by a youth section set up in 1957 in advance of the Labour Party actually re-establishing a national youth organisation again uh, a few years later. The first annual report of this body recorded that the youth section uh, which the set up had grown from six to 37 members. The print room for rally had to be increased from 250 to 600 copies uh, in part because orders were coming in both nationally and internationally including from Sri Lanka, India and Canada as far away as far away as that. Uh, as well as political campaigning then the youth section and later the Young Socialists organised dancers at Valentine's Day in Christmas to raise funds. Uh, one of these Valentine dancers, Pauline told me recently, had the Beatles uh, uh, performing at it uh, in their very early days. But this work 
that the comrades were engaged in, of putting forward our analysis on a number of, you know, on a number of issues, of engaging in struggles in the Liverpool area, uh, uh, it helped attract a new layer of youth to our tendency, including a number of comrades who play a crucial role, not least of which were Keith Dickinson and Peter Taft, two of the five expelled members of the militant editorial board in 1983, but also the late Tony Mulhern, one of the leaders of the Liverpool City Council struggle in the 1980s. Uh, the comrades also played a leading role in the city in the apprentice strikes of 1960 and, and 1964, because this really was the other twin pillar uh, of our work that we based ourselves upon, uh, uh, orientation towards the organised working class. Pat was a lifelong trade unionist. He was a delegate uh, uh, in, in Liverpool from Usdor to the Liverpool Trades Council and the Labour Party, which at that point was still uh, a, a joint body. He played an important role in developing a base for Usdor, uh, sorry, for Militant in Usdor. Uh, he spoke at the first Militant Readers meeting, as we used to call public meetings back then, in that union. Uh, and after, later, after a change of work, he remained acting in the trade unions, joining ASTMS, uh, which later became uh, MSF and now is a part of Unite. The position in the trade union movement, though, that Pat is most known for was as president of Bradford Trades Council, a position that the comrades won after he moved to that city in the course of two years, starting from two comrades and consistently putting forward a clear programme that won support from serious activists. In Pat's words, much to our surprise, we were approached by some of the best non-cliqued member of the council to contest the presidency against the dictatorial, undemocratic rulings of the Communist Party president. And this was a position that Pat held from 1973 for 14 years uh, uh, when he was elected as an MP in 1987. Given the prominent position that we now hold in trades councils in Yorkshire and across the country, then one document Pat wrote in a member's bulletin, drawing some of the lessons of work in Bradford Trades Council, I think should be read very widely by comrades. And I do want to just touch on uh, a small part of this document in terms of advice that Pat gives in that, uh, which I think applies very well to work in the trade unions today. Uh, he says, as in any other work, our first task is to seek support for our programme, to make contacts and win union members. In Liverpool Trades Council and Borough Labour Party, we started in the early 50s as a small group putting distinct policies, but part of the general left in a right-wing dominated council. It was only when the right-wings were defeated that we emerged as a distinct force. The debates were then between left reformists and the Marxists. Uh, um, you know, this achievement was the result uh, you know, where, where we led uh, that body was the result of sustained, consistent work, a consistent political position and a sane approach to what was and what was not possible in the organisational fields. It goes on to say that the main duty of our comrades is to broaden the scope of trades councils, to transform them from talking shops into councils of action. As with most revolutionary work, this requires years of patient, consistent application. It means gradually developing links with the stewards committees, it means actively supporting strikes and disputes, it means building up contact lists in all major factories, it means constantly speaking out on the major general issues faced in trade unionists and the working people in general. It means coordinating the activity of various distinct groups of workers. Uh, in, in, in a word, developing the relevance and the authority of the trades councils. Uh, you know, and I think comrades uh, you know, in Hull and, and Leeds and elsewhere, uh, 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 living up to that legacy uh, today. There were many initiatives that the Trades Council under the leadership of Pat and the Militant took. Uh, uh, you know, those included, uh, you know, from the very basic things of supporting workers' struggle, but also drawing together the movement to discuss strategies uh, uh, to fight uh, pressing issues such as the growing redundancy crisis uh, in the Bradford area. But one of the major initiatives they took early in Pat's tenure was to take up the growth of the far-right National Front in Bradford, establishing an anti-racism subcommittee, uh, an important step as tackling the far-right shouldn't be the job of special committees and, or campaigns, but of the workers' movement as a whole. This is both on the grounds that the threat the far-right posed to attempting to smash the workers' movement uh, directly, but also in the need for mobilising the overwhelming weight of the working class to stop divisive racist marches and link that with a programme for social transformation to tackle the underlying inequalities and inequities rooted in the capitalist system, which racist ideas oppose as a way of solving by blaming particular sections uh, 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 of workers or communities. 
a counter demonstration to a march by the National Front in May 1974, who had started holding meetings in Bradford around that time, was called by the Labour Party Young Socialists uh, uh, and uh, as a national demonstration uh, and supported by the Trades Council. And it was actually the first national demonstration against the National Front called by any section uh, of the Labour movement. That event, uh, you know, which you know, wasn't the end of that uh, uh, campaign, but it didn't go without incident. Two militant supporters carrying the banner of the Trades Council, who were a little isolated for the main demo, were attacked by National Front supporters, and the Trades Council banner uh, uh, was destroyed. In writing a report to Militant about this, Pat not only outlined uh, what had happened, but, uh, but also the way the police stood by, let that happen, and then the courts let the two people eventually apprehended for this off, was simply being bound over. But he used it to explain the role of the capitalist state. He explains at the end of this article, which was published in The Militant, in a class society, justice serves the interests of the exploiting class. It is entirely utopian to believe that the menace of racialism uh, and fascism can be dealt with by the courts. Only the mobilization of the enormous strength of the labor movement around a clear socialist program to transform society can provide a guarantee against reaction. It was this way of taking examples from people's lives and using them to draw out and explain Marxist ideas that every single person I've ever spoken uh, to about Pat who heard him speak said this was his greatest gift. If you flick through the back issues of Militant, then especially was Pat, when Pat was president of the Trades Council, then there'd be adverts for Pat speaking at young socialist meetings here, a trade union meeting there, or a Militant read readers meeting in another city sometimes several times in the same week, such was the demand uh, he was in. But this issue of the state was another issue that ran right through Pat's life. In the letter from Bill Thompson I quoted earlier, he also talks about the first motion Pat moved to be put forward to, uh, to the Labour Party annual conference, which included the demand for democratic control of the armed forces by workers, uh, uh, sorry, uh, through elections by the ranks of the army of their officers. And by the way, this wasn't put as some abstract question, but very practical because like other young men at the time, Pat was due to be called up for national service. But it was in raising some of these points in a debate with the SWP in 1982, which was secretly recorded by a journalist from the Sunday Time, that Pat became a nationally known uh, uh, figure uh, when a sensationalized account of his speech appeared in the press with Pat being posed as being hell-bent on bloodshed and civil war. Uh, according to the Sunday Times. What Pat had actually explained was in contrast to those who insist on revolutions being inherently violent affairs uh, and bloodthirsty affairs, then Marxists were in favour of a peaceful transition to a socialist society based on public ownership and democratic workers' control and management of the economy. The threat of civil war came from the capitalist class, who faced with dispossession of their wealth and power by workers, uh, um, uh, um, would, would attempt, you know, would use every measure uh, in their toolbox to try and keep uh, 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 that power, and that could only be countered on the basis of mobilising the full power of the workers' movement. Pat also recognised that the ro the role of the state wasn't just limited to uh, the question of armed bodies of men, but also the role of other uh, uh, parts such as the media in maintaining the status quo in society. Uh, after this speech, he was hounded, as was his family, with photographers ca camped outside his house, to the extent that Pauline had to put up the NUJ's code of professional conduct outside their house. And if comrades want to hear Pat's, Pat speaking, to hear his voice, then there's a recording of him on the Any Questions radio show uh, 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 from 1987 on YouTube. Uh, and in that clip, then Pat that again explains that the private ownership of the mass media is used as a tool to aid the agenda of the parties representing the interests of the capitalist uh, media moguls. This can only be challenged by, in the first instance, building our own working class media, uh, uh, such as the militant and the socialists that we produce today, uh, and other things we do today as well, but, but, but also, crucially, by fighting for public ownership of the mass media and their resources, and for the allocation of printing and broadcasting resources democratically based on popular support for those ideas rather than those being a province of a few uh, 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 rich individuals. Like all genuine Marxists, Pat was an internationalist. For us, this flows from the global nature of capitalism and therefore the need to link the struggles of workers around the globe to overthrow that system. During his national service in the mid-50s, 
Pat attended a demonstration in Germany in solidarity with the Hungarian Revolution. And he also had the opportunity to attend the conference of the French Trotskyist organization uh, in Paris that we had ties to at that time whilst he was abroad. On Liverpool uh, Trade Council and Labour Party, then he and Keith Dickinson moved support for, for the Algerian Revolution and solidarity actions to be called in Liverpool. Even with our limited force at the time, then our, our attendance, he sent two comrades to Algeria, including Jimmy Dean, who was then the General Secretary of the organisation, to assist the revolutionaries uh, 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 there. This continued throughout Pat's life, particularly after he became a buyer for mail order companies, which increased his opportunities for travel, where he sought to establish political links while he visited countries like Sri Lanka, Hong Kong, uh, uh, South Korea and others. Uh, there's a series of articles that comrades could read uh, uh, from, uh, you know, which he wrote after a visit to the US that deal both with the question of the trade unions, but also the question uh, of race in the US that he wrote in the late uh, uh, 70s. As an MP, he was active on international issues, not least of which as an MP for Bradford North, an area with a large Pakistani and Kashmiri communities in relation to issues in those countries, but as well defending, uh, you know, the question of defending the rights of migrants. He also spoke in Parliament on other issues as well, such as the brutal dictatorship under Pin Pinochet in Chile, and personally took in Chilean refugees at the time of, the, uh, of, of uh, uh, Pinochet's uh, coup. But also he talked about both the Tiananmen Square massacre uh, in, uh, uh, sorry, protests in China and the crisis in Stalinism in Eastern Europe uh, uh, that year. If he hadn't become ill in 1990, then he was due to speak on the anniversary of Trotsky's murder in Pakistan that year to mark the 50th anniversary. So I think it's particularly apt today that we're discussing both Trotsky and, and Pat's ideas. I've not talked about the Labour Party uh, 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 re in that much detail yet, but of course throughout this whole period, Pat was part of our tendency and we worked in the Labour Party uh, at, at that time. And that's for us, a basic rule for us uh, at all times is to engage in the, uh, you know, in engaging in the class struggle is to go where the workers are. Well, this is not a dogma. It's a flexible strategy that at different points necessitate, necessitates different tactics. In the uh, 1940s, then we operated as, a, you know, our predecessors operated as an independent tendency before, you know, the Revolutionary Communist Party, which stood in parliamentary by, in a parliamentary by-election and in council elections against Labour in order to reach workers drawing more radical conclusions at the time uh, of the, you know, the end of the Second World War. In the mid 50s, at the time of the events in Hungary, whilst Pat and others were still active Labour Party members, our, our tendency made a direct appeal to those in the Communist Party who were questioning these events as a revolutionary socialist league, uh, you know, as an openly identified uh, uh, organisation. But at all points, our overall strategy is to win workers to the revolutionary pr program and organization that we defend, as well as fighting for a mass political voice of the working class. And the fact of the matter is that unlike today, then workers look to and could have a real influence in the policy uh, of the Labour Party through its democratic structures, including the district Labour parties, such as the one we led in Liverpool, which directed the council struggle with 500 elected delegates attending it, but also the party's annual, the Labour Party's annual conference, which was a sovereign policy-making body at that time, not uh, unlike what ha you know what happened uh, after Pat's death, when these things were destroyed by Kinnock and Blair, alongside their move to openly embracing capitalism, and unfortunately weren't reversed in, in any fundamental way by the Corbyn uh, 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 phenomena. Pat was a regular delegate to the Labour Party conference, both when in Liverpool and Bradford and was part of some very important debates where the ideas militant fought for won the day in those discussions. In 1972, Pat moved the motion calling for the Labour NEC to, and I quote, formulate a socialist plan of production based on public ownership with minimum compensation of the commanding heights of the economy. Adding, such a programme can only succeed with the active participation of trade unions and working class people in general, and calls for a plan for the democratic control of industry through workers' man management, um, uh, uh, this was passed uh, uh, by a you know by a majority by the conference, despite uh, 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 Pat rejecting uh, attempts to uh, um, to uh, dilute the motion by kind of putting qualifications on by the leadership, which meant it was actually opposed 
uh, uh, by the Labour, uh, you know, was voted through in opposition to the Labour uh, NEC. Pat concluded his speech on this by saying, I'm absolutely certain that no power on earth can stand in the way of the organised working class movement if it decides to change society on behalf of the working people of this country. In 1979, he moved one of the motions calling for bringing forward constitu constitutional amendments uh, in the Labour Party to implement mandatory reselection. I want to quote just one part of it, and it's not the bit that's usually quoted from it. <laughs> um, but I think it's a really brilliant illustration of Pat's clarity of thought. Uh, responding to a right winger, Shirley Williams, who went on to found, found the right wing split from the Labour, the Social Democratic Party, Pat retorts that, that she said that to have this argument at this time about mandatory selection is like the crew of the Titanic having a punch up in the engine room. And he says, I think this is precisely the point, because I think the constituency activists in our movement are the crewmen. And I think that they are not prepared any longer to just do the donkey work, which is to send Labour MPs to Parliament unless they have a say to avoid the leadership colliding with the iceberg. And they want to say about how the bridge is run as well as how the engine room is run. Pat was a, a candidate as well for the Labour Party NEC. Uh, as a constituency representative, all of which the seats were held at that time by MPs. Uh, they didn't have separate representation on the body, on that body, which was again a, a move, uh, 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 you know, to give in uh, uh, the MPs actually more uh, 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 prominence uh, along with uh, councillors and so on in the Labour Party. And Pat actually won the highest vote of anybody that hadn't been an MP that stood for that body in 1982, winning over 100,000 uh, votes at the conference. He held uh, almost every position that you could in the Labour Party at various times. Uh, that included being elected a councillor, first in Liverpool in 1962 and then a decade later in Bingley before the Urban District Council he was elected to, uh, was abolished. In, 19, in 1974, uh, he uh, was put forward in the selection contest for Blythe constituency for the Labour Party, in which he came a narrow second. And given his authority in Bradford, then he was a natural person for workers to want to put up when they wanted to challenge the right-wing MP, uh, uh, Ben Ford in Bradford North. The battle to win this seat would span two general elections, uh, having to fight not just the Tories, as you would expect, who used the Sunday Times recordings in one of their election broadcasts in the run-up to the 1987 uh, uh, general election, but it was also fought against those supposed to be on Pat's side, those supposed to want a Labour victory, the Labour right-wing. Pat's initial victory in the selection battle was forced to be rerun after that Sunday Times report uh, uh, with uh, the Labour leader, Michael Foote, uh, regarded to, to be on the left, uh, was reported saying at that time that it would be unwise for the constituency to, to select uh, uh, Pat. But despite this, Pat was reselected with an even bigger majority, refusing to accept defeat twice. Then Ford uh, stood in the general election as an independent Labour candidate and along with an SDP candidate, as well as foot on the uh, chiding pat about the need to abide by the whip in public at his Eva poll rally, did enough damage to the Labour vote to see the Tories win by 1,600 uh, uh, majority. The comrades fought successfully for Pat to win the selection ahead in the next general election in 1987, and we went on to win that by a, uh, you know, by a similar margin to what he was defeated by in 1983, and that was on the basis of huge efforts of campaigning, mobilising mass canvases, holding meetings uh, with translation uh, in, in areas where, where English was a second language, holding factory meetings and so on uh, uh, today, you know, really reflecting the, the implantation, you know, Pat and the militant had uh, amongst the working class in Bradford. But more battles were to come, uh, you know, straight after uh, Pat was elected. A new witch hunt was launched against militant supporters in Bradford North. Uh, almost immediately after the election, uh, which eventually led to a number of comrades being expelled uh, from the Labour Party there. Another battle was waged against the right-wing Labour group on the council, who refused to rent Pat an office in the City Hall, a battle that took uh, seven months to win. And despite all these hurdles being thrown at him, then Pat was, uh, uh, you know, was again selected to be the candidate uh, for the Labour Party in the next election for Bradford War, uh, uh, North. Unfortunately, uh, uh, Pat became, uh, uh, you know, quite uh, uh, seriously, uh, serious, uh, seriously ill uh, during his tenure uh, in office. Uh, and such were the spiteful nature of the right, then these attacks continued, even when he was on his hospital bed less than a month before passing away. Uh, he had 
to write to the uh, you know from his hospital bed objecting to the attacks on uh, the 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 uh, uh, comrades and other people that staffed his parliamentary office and helped uh, with his uh, 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 with his um, Oh, I've forgotten the word for it. <laughs> um, his uh, surgeries in the constituency. Uh, he says of, of Howard Oakes, for, uh, for example, a comrade who's still active today. Uh, uh, then we, you know, he was hired because they had a little money in, uh, uh, available in the kitty, and the work that they were involved in was expanding. And and he offered Howard temporary work. And he said that since then, Howard became almost indispensable. And he, you know, in the notes he wrote there he, he, he talks effusively about the work that uh, um, com you know comrades were able to do in, in struggling to support uh, uh, workers and that and, and you can really read uh, Pat's anger that um, the right wing would try and attack uh, those you know those people to get to him. Pat stuck to his promises that he made ahead of being elected like the other two militant uh, uh, supporting MPs, Dave Nellis and Terry Fields, then he was a workers MP on a workers wage. Like them, he took part in the mass struggle against the poll tax that led to the jailing of Terry Fields and 30 other militant supporters for non-payment. But that movement brought down Thatcher, uh, you, know, as, uh, uh, you know, as comrades will know. And again, is another discussion in itself. If the comrades in this meeting contributed half or a quarter as much as Pat did to the struggle, then they would be making a huge contribution to the workers' movement. Pat was a towering figure in our movement, and we can best honour his legacy by deepening our understanding of Marxism and putting those lessons into practice in the struggle of the working class and building our party uh, to one that can achieve the goal that Pat spent his life struggling for, the socialist transformation of society. Ian's speech was uh, very comprehensive and it brought back some memories and some things I couldn't remember either, so it was, it was very comprehensive, and uh, thanks to Ian for that. I only want to say a couple of words uh, about Pat. The first thing I'd say is how he managed to make very complicated ideas very simple. He didn't water things down, he didn't take shortcuts in the ideas, but he was somebody who was imbued in the ideas of Marxism. He spent obviously years studying Marxism, but he was able to explain it, those ideas in a simple fashion to workers. Certainly it's something I learned from when I joined the party about uh, how to try and translate those complicated ideas into ideas that workers can grasp or are coming fresh to the ideas of socialism. The highlight of Trade's council meetings at Bradford was when Pat decided to leave the chair as president and speak from the floor. Uh, and on, everyone was waiting for his contributions on the politics of the day. About 70 people used to attend the Trades Council meetings. And it wasn't just because the trade union movement was more active in those days. People wanted to come to Trades Councils because they wished to hear uh, Pat uh, speaking. He incidentally also banned alcohol from trade council meetings because prior to him becoming president, people uh, sometimes were worse for drink at those meetings and he banned it and made sure it was a, a sober, if you like, uh, labour movement event which dealt th with things in a sober fashion. He was also a dedicated member of the party. Uh, when I first joined uh, the Bradford branch as it was uh, developing in the 1970s, I remember him coming to branch meetings every week, taking 20 papers, coming back the week after with the money for 20 papers. Every week he sold, I think it was a weekly, then it might be a fortnightly, I can't remember, but he used to pay for 20 papers and he used to sell them as well. I'd only just say one other thing, and that is the difference between uh, reform and revolution. Pat was a revolutionary, and it's very easy as a parliamentarian to come under pressure and forget the ideas that got you into Parliament in the first place. But he was dedicated to the ideas of socialism, the ideas of, of militants. Uh, he was a workers' MP on a workers' wage, but it was very easy, I think, for many parliamentarians with the best will of the world to bend uh, to the, uh, the, 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 the old boys' club of, of Parliament. He did not do that. He stuck to his ideas of, of revolution. But unlike Pat, 
uh, many of his uh, supporters and compatriots and even comrades uh, uh, broke with Marxism in the uh, when the witch hunt took place. Uh, the Labour Party, uh, as it, social became uh, less popular due to the collapse of Stalinism, we saw a reaction inside the Labour Party, and people who were his, his erstwhile supporters, who were left reformists, uh, came into direct conflict against PAS. One prominent person was the chair of the constituency, Ronnie Fieldhouse, uh, and we, he became known as Ronnie, Ronnie Fieldmouse because of his, 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 uh, his um, cowardly approach and his retreat from the ideas of socialism. But uh, many people did that at that particular time, but he stuck to his guns. And that, that's it's like a lesson to be learned that we need to understand the ideas of Marxism, be able to translate them and, and explain them in a simple fashion, but also stick to those ideas, even in difficult times, those ideas are the rudder that keep us keeps us uh, in the going in the right direction. And thanks Ian for his, uh, his contributions, very comprehensive, and I hope the book comes out soon. <laughs> All right, thanks very much, Pete. I think that